Welcome to a special live episode of Let's Talk. I am Jackie Hill Perry, and I am here with Melissa Kruger and Jasmine Holmes. Give it up. Clap. There we go. So in our last episode of Let's Talk, I was nine months pregnant. Now this one is having a baby. Melissa? No. No? No. My baby's out there. Okay. You know, the Lord can make a Sarah out of you. Okay. <laughs> Just tell us how you want us to pray. We got you. I'm good. You, pray you for grandbabies. Wanna... <laughs> okay. Just not right now. <laughs> for a husband first, then a grandbaby. Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they can do the quick way if you want them to. Right. <laughs> so, today... Normally we can take pauses and it doesn't keep recording. So this is a lot more complicated. Um, So today we're going to be talking about the topic of spiritual disciplines. And I think when you hear that term, it can seem automatically negative. I'm like, discipline, you know, heavy. And so what I thought we could start talking about first is when have you seen discipline in your life be a good thing? Apart from spiritual disciplines, when have you seen actively working at something over and over and over grow you in a good way? Um, So earlier we were talking about this and you were talking about sports and I was thinking about my nerdy homeschool upbringing and how I have no coordination whatsoever. So instead of sports, mine was piano. (laughs) I practiced three hours a day and I won a competition. Can you still play? No. No. In typical nerd fashion, practiced three hours a day for six months, got carpal tunnel, and had to stop playing piano. I know, right? They're so sad for me. Thank you. You felt seen. I saw. Um, I I think uh, when I had my first child, Eden, uh, I had gained about 60 or 70 pounds because I just, I just ate Krispy Kreme every week. And um, it's just like that sometimes. And um, I saw a picture of myself and I just felt like I looked like a platypus. And so I thought, I need to lose some weight. <laughs> so I went in my kitchen and I just started throwing out everything that had GMOs and extra sugar. I even threw out ketchup. Because you know, ketchup is 60 grams of sugar. Per t- it's a lot. And so that, but I had never seen myself be as disciplined in that way before. But something switched in my head where I was like, if I want to change my body and my health, I have to become more strict about what I consume. And so that's an example. Yeah, I think that's actually such a good example because the junk food tastes good going in, but it doesn't make your body work well in the long run. But in the short term, it feels good. And I, I can remember that. I grew up playing sports and I played soccer and they made us run sprints the whole length of the field. And, you know, I was like, why do I have to run this whole length of the field? But then when you got in the game, you could actually run for 90 minutes. But it took training for week after week after week and that discipline. Before, but then I could actually have fun. Otherwise, I would have been miserable in the game if we hadn't have done that. And so I think when we talk about the concept of spiritual disciplines, the goal isn't misery. The goal is actually a soul that works right. And so when you think about spiritual disciplines, what are they? What do we even mean when we talk about spiritual disciplines? Um, Prayer. Bible reading. That's all I got. Church. I think that's a a kind of spiritual discipline. I got a definition for us. Oh, look I looked it up. Oh, okay. I looked it up. Donald Whitney has a book called Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Life. Have you either of y'all read that? Never it's, heard of it. It's really good. It's really good. Um, he said, spiritual disciplines are those personal and corporate disciplines, so personal and corporate disciplines, that promote spiritual growth. So it could be a Bible study. It could be corporate worship. It could be, it could even be, I think, like service you know, in the body, but also our private lives where we're praying and we're in the word and we're growing in those ways. So as you think about spiritual disciplines, like being in the word and prayer, 
when is it hard for you to put those things in your life? Like, are there certain seasons? Are there certain struggles? How do you get that into your busy life? It's a struggle every day. Um, I, I used to think that I would somehow find some balance between, uh, you know, work and marriage and parenthood and friendship that could somehow work really neatly together when it came to me, you know, looking for Jesus and being spiritually disciplined and engaging in all these other categories in which I'm called to. But I, there is no balance. It's, it's, it really is no such thing. And so it's always hard. Yes. Yeah, I agree. It's always hard. I do have like, I'll have seasons where I'm reading my Bible every day and I'm praying every day, but then the spiritual discipline kind of stops working because I'm like, oh yeah, I got this. <laughs> and then something will happen and then I'll like fall off the wagon. So for me, I've been reading the Bible. I talked about this the last time we were together, reading the Bible in a year. And um, Are you in Zephaniah yet? I'm in Ezekiel. Oh, I and you am. stayed there. I am. Look at you. I know. It's it's wild. It's a little weird. I was like, he want the God said to do what now? Yeah, it's to it, your body. Uh, okay. <laughs> Zeke was faithful, y'all. Oh. <laughs> but I fell off the wagon because I was sick. Um, I got pregnant, got sick, stayed sick, still sick. And so I got sick during Isaiah. And I was like, I'm just going to skip Isaiah. And I was like, no, 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 no. No, you're not. All scripture <laughs> is God. I was like, brings. you're going to catch up. So I was like, for days, just filling my head with prophets and prophecy. And, but, I, but I caught up. I did. But it was not easy. It was definitely disciplining myself to keep going. And I think sometimes in those days, especially with Bible reading, with that discipline, you feel like, well, it's not making any difference, so why does it matter? Because some of those parts of Isaiah, and you're like, where, what kingdom are we talking about? And what is going on here? You, know, you get so lost. And sometimes I realize I may only pick up one thing the whole time I read it through this year, but maybe next year I'll pick up something new. I, I was actually talking to my husband. I was reading Luke in Bible in a Year plan this week, and I read this passage, and I was like, is that new? Surely I've read Luke before, and Jesus, at the end of Luke, right before his crucifixion, tells them they need to get swords. And I was like, I don't remember that. Was this here? You know, it's like, it's new, and it's like every time you read, you're learning, you're picking up on a little something new. And so I think there's this benefit of just, even when today might not be great or you didn't feel like you learned something, tomorrow you might. And so you keep at it. It's like, I don't know, with exercise, sometimes you have a really good run, but it probably took four bad runs to get to the good one. And I think that's true of spiritual disciplines. And I think sometimes we think it should feel good every time. And that is actually what makes us stop from doing it. Yeah. I I had a wise woman when I had my first daughter. I think that's when I noticed that the difficulty switched, you know? I think when I was single, there was more time. I did have more space in my brain to be able to, you know, engage, engage with real highfalutin uh, doctors and scripture and stuff like that. But when I had a baby, it's just like, bro, she was crying every hour. I just really don't want to read this. Um, but she told me, she said, even if you read a sentence and just think about that sentence the entire day, that's fruitful. And so it just helped me to see I was putting more of a burden and pressure on myself than God might have been, you know? Like, he's like, if you just read John 3.16 and meditated on that, that might have more power for the rest of your week than if you read all of Ephesians and ignored it, so. Yeah. No, that's a really good point because I think sometimes, especially in certain seasons, I think it's good to say, what can I do in this season, yeah. you know, it's not certain seasons you can go to seminary and you can study more in depth. And that, you know, it's, it, that's a really good time where, you know, every time I feel like I learned everything after I took the test, I, like that's that picture of discipline. Once you finally really studied it, you learned it and then you knew it. And I think um, there need to be times when we do push ourselves like that, but there also need to be seasons where we can say, okay, if I read one chapter a day or one verse a day, and, and pray and meditate on that, 
that's enough for right now. Would, would you say that spiritual disciplines are non-negotiables? And if so, why? Uh, I would definitely say they're not negotiable because God demands our heart. He demands our mind. He demands our, like church membership is something that's non-negotiable. Being part of a body, um, however that looks, is not negotiable. That's what Christians have been called to in the word. Um, I do think that we can get a little bit, I find with, for myself, when I think about the church throughout the history of the world, us having our own personal Bibles is this really amazing thing that other Christians didn't have access to. So I'm loath to say, like, if you don't read your Bible every day in some capacity, you're in sin, because that would be definitely a new rule. Um, but prayerfulness and... Melissa, you, you're going to know that you're going to know the passage. Yes, you are. I'm willing it. Where? Because oh, we wrote about it in the in that book together, you and me. <laughs> That's the pregnancy brain right yeah. there. You, you and me in that blue book. <laughs> Identity theft. Yes. <laughs> it is the pregnancy brain. <laughs> Abiding. That's what I was going to say. Oh, John? John 15? You about to cry? <laughs> you sound emotional, Jasmine. John 15. Your John estrogen 15. is peaking. Golly. <laughs> well, you knew it. I said yes. you would. Yes, John 15. Okay. Abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Yeah, I'm done. That one. Okay, you're done. Okay. Okay. But apart from me, you can do nothing. That, see, our brains together work. <laughs> And I think that's a good point. So when you were talking about it being non-negotiable, if we're not abiding in Jesus, we're not going to bear fruit. Like there's a direct correlation between abiding in him and, and bearing fruit or not abiding in him and being a dry branch. And that's the reality. So it's not that, you know, I, I never, there's no angel up in heaven with a star chart saying, well, you did your quiet time today, Jasmine. Yeah, I'm going to check it off. But there is a direct correlation between the fruit that's born in my life and the time spent in abiding in Jesus. That's what, that's what I was going to say. I knew. That's what you meant. For, for y'all then, you know, in different seasons of life, what, what is like practically working for you in spending time with God? Do you schedule it? say 9 a.m. I'm going to meet with Jesus. Is it super random and sporadic where it's like, oh, I'm washing dishes. Let me, you know, listen to Bible Project or something. Like, what is it? I, I'm a pretty scheduled person, but it's changed when it is. So like when I was in high school and college, I used to say, I just want to read my Bible before I go to bed tonight. And it was kind of like homework. Yeah, I just viewed it as, I just, I I really saw it as an act of belief. Like, I believe there is life in God's word. And so to take hold of that life, I'm going to make a plan. And so I just would kind of say, just like you brush your teeth before you go to bed, I'm going to read my Bible before I go to bed. Now I do it in the morning just because my schedule allows that. When I had young kids, I did it during nap time. I would just, and I would always take some time to plan what am I going to study. Yeah, go ahead. So you didn't take a nap. <laughs> like you read the Bible instead of going to sleep? I did. I'm wow, sorry. you're so holy. I'm not I'm not there. I'm yet. not that holy. Not you know, Netflix got a lot of documentaries they've been dropping and I just been like, ooh, let me catch this one. During nap time. I'm sorry. Wow. Don't, 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 don't apologize be sorry for your us. righteousness. That's the Lord. <laughs> What about you, Jasmine? Uh, I usually, so um, I just turned 31 this week, so I'm trying to be good and Happy do my skin. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to do my skincare routine because, you know, you know, you're getting older, you're in your 30s, time to be taking care of yourself. So when I do my skincare routine, I seriously, I listen to my Bible. That's when I do it. That's smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do the dwell app. The listening option is a whole new thing. You know, I mean, that's a really nice thing to be able to do, to just put it. Do you have the dwell app? Mm -hmm. I love it. That's I love it so good. much. That's really good. Mm -hmm. I've just, I walked one day, I was in a really kind of just bad place. You know, it was a hard situation and I put that on and I just let it read scripture to me. And it was really 
really encouraging, all the different accents, and it was nice. Yeah, I think sometimes when I, like, because I teach and I write and I read as my job, sometimes I approach the Bible that way, and I'm immediately thinking, like, oh, yeah, how can I use this passage in what I'm teaching on this topic, or how can I use this passage in the chapter on this topic? And reading at normal speed, instead of reading the fast way that I read, read and the looking for information way that I read, helps me to kind of slow down and really meditate on the word. Because otherwise I can get very like, get to the end of the chapter, what's the point? Like, what, is, what are they trying to say? Like Abimelech, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he killed a bunch of people and dad. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm like summarize spirit, it, summarize spirit, it. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so with... I think sometimes it might be easier to consume biblical content than it is to pray. And so would you say that you're praying and engaging with scripture at the same time, or you're having to find spaces in your day to seek God, you know, conversationally? Like how, Cause I think for me, um, I've seen that it, it best suits my heart when both are intertwined. You know, because one, trying to understand the scriptures as inspired by the Holy Spirit, it, it becomes easier when I've sought God during it. God, help me. Help me see. Help me understand. Help me see my own heart, etc. But I also think that after reading the scriptures, you just have more content for what to pray to God with. But it's not that simple most of the time, you know? And so I guess how have you balanced being able to also speak with God as well as read about God? I think for me, especially in the prophets right now, especially in Ezekiel right now, I will be like, pause the, pause the thing and be like, God, what? Like, I, I need wisdom. I need guidance because I don't understand what's happening right now. So I find myself praying for guidance a lot as I read that I would be able to just pull out the things that are going to help me to glorify God, just pull out the things that are going to help me meditate on him more. Um, so I do, I find myself praying a lot while I'm reading, like while I'm in the act. No, that's, that's good. I, I feel like I need to grow in bringing prayer into all of my day. We talked about this a few weeks ago in the prayer episode or whenever it was. I listened to it a few weeks ago on the prayer episode. But I feel like I need to grow in that. So I can sometimes just, I have to guard against coming to God with a list and rather let what I'm reading in the scriptures and that meditation help my prayer life. I feel like that's something I need to work on and do better at. Can I ask you a clar clarification question? Is it wrong to come to God with a list? No, no, I, I hope not. Because <laughs> sometimes actually what I've started doing now is just writing out the list because I, I get it out and I'm like, okay, I did remember to pray for Jasmine about what she asked me to pray for. Sometimes it just helps me to know I, when I said it to my friend, I actually did it, you know, just to write their name out. But I also want to sit before the Lord and just say, what should I pray for? Will you bring to mind someone, maybe who's not on my list, that you want me to pray for? And that takes time and stillness, and that's hard to do in busy lives. I learned from one uh, woman, she said, find something that you do daily and integrate prayer into that. So if, you, if it's brushing your teeth, not everybody does it daily, but you know, if, if that's, <laughs> I'm saying, it, I'm, no shame. Um, we got mask on, so I'm protected. Um, if it's brushing your teeth, speak to God while brushing your teeth. If it's washing dishes, speak to God while washing dishes. This might be TMI. A really great prayer closet for me is not a closet, it's my shower. One, there's no phones, there's no babies, there's no husband, there's just me. And so that's been a really great place for me to just give God a lot, you know, and be really honest in a real way. Yeah, now that's good to have places because then it's a reminder. I know some of my friends do it like in a carpool line, you know, and that's a, that's a good place. How do you, when it comes to spiritual disciplines, guard against legalism? So sometimes as we're doing our spiritual disciplines, we can start feeling pretty good about ourselves and say, well, look at me, you know, I'm so spiritual. So how do we go after knowing God? Like that's a good thing to pursue without thinking that makes us more righteous before God. I got this one good. because I'm a legalist. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's my sin. I got this. Um, 
For I find that God often takes care of it for me. I will be feeling very prideful. Like recently, like I said, I was like, I'm reading the Bible in a year and I'm doing so good. And then seriously, God told me to get pregnant because I hate being pregnant. And God was like, too bad. So, and I did, and I got so sick and stopped reading and was just like, praying, but only praying to not be sick and like lost touch with all my friends and lost. And I just feel like part of that, part of that obviously is just making a baby is hard work on your body. But the other part is God used that to humble me because I had definitely been like, oh, I've got it down. I've got it in my little planner. I'm like, I'm doing it every day. I'm like checking it off my checklist. And God brought me to a point of need where being in the word wasn't just for me to check something off my checklist abiding with Christ and praying for daily strength was something that I felt like I needed to survive. Um, And so I don't know the trick to not, I don't know a better trick to not let pride intervene than to let God humble you because he will, he will. And it's a scary prayer to pray, but maybe we need to pray it more often. I, I think we, I, choose to remember that I'm doing this so that I can know a person, you know, like I'm reading so I can know a person. I'm praying so I can speak with and meet with a person. I am going to church and talking to my brothers and sisters in Christ so that we all in, you know, as saints can reveal and speak to each other and show off a person and I think when it when it when it becomes about intimacy and loving Jesus and doing the things that you need to do so you can grow in your love for Jesus then you actually get distracted because now you're not even thinking about yourself enough to say oh I'm doing this so I can you know be this person it just literally just becomes about Jesus at that point and and so that's been really helpful for me is to identify the reason why I'm doing it yeah yeah I think Uh, I I go with Jasmine when I fall flat on my face. It is always that moment of, huh, I've been reading all these passages, but I can't live them. And it's that moment when you say, yeah, I can quote the fruit of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace. Yeah, I can quote it. But then when you're dealing with a frustrating person uh, who just cut you off when you're driving and you find yourself just so angry, or maybe when you're waiting in line at the Skywalk. I don't know if anybody had that happen today. <laughs> you know, things, things that might be happening here. But then I'm like, oh, it's not just reading it. It's being changed by it. And so it's really humbling to say, no, I need the Spirit's work, not just to read the words, but then to change me in it. I think the other side of the coin, we can go toward legalism, but we can also go toward despair. So sometimes I've heard people say, I just can't do that. I just can't read my Bible faithfully. I'm just not that type of Christian. I just can't pray. You know, it's just, and God still loves me, you know, so they can almost, or they can go toward despair and say, I'm just not a good Christian. You know, have you, have you dealt with that side of things too? Like, oh, I didn't do these things and now maybe God won't love me. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely, probably when I was younger, um, struggled with that to not check off the checklist and get it done. Um, I think one of the, it's interesting because the cure is the thing that you're running away from because the more that you learn about God, the more you learn about who he is, the more you learn about who he loves, the less despair, the less opportunity despair has to take root in your heart. And so just keeping in mind that despair can be, well, shame can be a tool of the enemy to keep us from going to God. So it, it turns into like the very thing that's going to heal you is the thing that you think is going to destroy you. But that's how Satan has always worked. Come on here. Sorry, <laughs> my Pentecostal came out. I'm at TGC, I forgot. Um, I think, though, I think there's always the possibility, not always, but there is also the possibility that underneath the despair is some idols, you know, where I think it should be concerning to you or alarming to you 
if you can continue your day-to-day -day life without any spiritual disciplines. I think that should alert you to where am I at that this doesn't concern me that I haven't met with God that I haven't read his word, that I, I, I claim to say that I'm in a relationship, but I'm not doing the things that will help the relationship grow and flourish. And so I think there's a way in which someone should say, hmm, maybe there's some idols underneath this despair. That's, that's good. I wanna talk about that. Cause, so what, what are the idols that keep us from time with the Lord? How, what is going on in our hearts? Cause I like to say to people, Look for a pattern of life, not perfection. So our goal in spiritual disciplines is not, there's no star chart again. It's not to be perfect. We, I mean, that, we've already lost that a long time ago. But to have a pattern of life that's growing toward God. So what keeps us? What gets in the way? What makes us say to ourselves, I don't really need that? Because there's a reality at some level that it's unbelief. You know, we're saying, I believe today I need something else more than God's word and I need something more than prayer because I've spent my whole day on some other things. So what are those things that drive us? I can speak for me. Um, I think one of my biggest struggles is self-sufficiency. But the self-sufficiency comes out of, oh, I'm not, I know a lot of Bible. So I don't, I don't really need to engage with it today. And so it's like you're, you're literally, you know, it's like a car that thinks it's okay because it has last year's gas. It's like, nah, you need to fill up today too. Um, I think also uh, busyness or the idol of ambition. And so you're feeling, filling your time with, you know, just I'm an Enneagram three, so I'm just going and doing and succeeding and doing all these things where I filled up my calendar with all this other stuff except the Lord. So that shows where my idol is, where my heart is, you know? And so those are a few of them. I think pride too. Pride is sneaky. Um, sometimes pride looks like despair, but it's actually just like, woe is me. I'm not perfect, and I should be. And even that is just, again, another idol, like the idol of our own perfection, the idol of our own checklist. And I think one thing I can see with me is sometimes people pleasing. Because I say, oh, I'm going to be so at your demands for what you need. And it's going to look almost Christian. And I'm going to say, well, I'm serving so much, you know, but it's like Mary and Martha, you know, and so she's so busy and she's upset that Mary's sitting at Jesus's feet. And he said, she's chosen the better portion. It's not going to be taken from her. And so I think sometimes even my Christian actions can be reason that, yeah, they can actually keep me away from knowing Jesus. My God, I'll say it out loud. That was so good. Melissa, y'all didn't think that was good? Nobody clapped. Let me say, let me reiterate it for you in churchy terms. She said that sometimes the idol underneath not pursuing spiritual disciplines is people pleasing that looks Christian. Therefore, it's deceptive because you think I'm doing a good thing, I'm a, but you're saying I'm, I'm serving you, but I don't need to meet with you. My God. You said it so much better. I didn't. Oh, I, just said I just needed to reiterate it in my That's Pentecostal good. voice. That's good. Now, this is a question here that I think is, is helpful is like for your children. All of us have children. Not everybody has children. And so I want us to be mindful of that. But when it comes to your parenting, what is it that you want to model to your children in how you spend your time? You know, I didn't realize how important this was. Um, and y'all, if I start crying, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not even pregnant. I can't say that I have like emotions. Or right. are you? <laughs> Ship has sailed. Ship has sailed. Um, but my, I wrote a book called Five Things to Pray for Your Children. And my daughter, Emma, who's here, um, actually wrote the foreword in it. And one thing she wrote that I didn't even know um, is how much our kids are watching us. And she said, I learned about prayer by what I'd come down every morning and see my mom praying. And she said, and that made it seem like the thing you're supposed to do. And so I wasn't doing that as a teaching lesson. I was doing that because I needed Jesus and I knew he was that oxygen that I needed. But I think so often we can talk about prayer with our kids and we can talk about Bible reading with our kids and we can say these things are important, but if they see the pattern of our lives is in opposition to that, 
our words are always going to ring hollow. And so it hit me, you know, it didn't hit me till 19 years in when she wrote that. Oh, that mattered. Not, not because it was something I was saying, but because our lives really are giving shape to the, what, what does the Christian life look like? I hope it looks like they see us on our knees. I hope it looks like they see us actually reading the word in our homes, that this is our life, you know, that we don't just do it on Sunday, but that this is really part of our family. What's hard is I was talking to my husband, Preston, and I was telling him how I wonder if I should be more intentional about reading the Bible in an actual Bible. Because there are times when I'm legitimately reading the Bible on my phone, and I don't know if my children would grow up being able to discern the difference between me being on social media and me being in the Word. Because when I hear the testimonies of people, you know, who I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but when I hear the testimonies of people that did, they always say they saw their parents in a Bible. And I, I don't know, I'm not saying it's a, a law, but I just wonder if that's working against the model that I want to show her of a woman that loves God's word. I hadn't even thought about that. That's yeah. a really great point. In our modern world, yeah. it's so easy, but they can't tell, are you scrolling Instagram or are you scrolling Jonah? You know, they can't, they can't tell. And so that's a hard, that's a good point. Yeah, I think, um, so the other day, my son, Wynn, had a really hard time at school um, because he's my son. And he got in the car and I was like, buddy, what did, what did we do? What happened? And he's talking to me about it. And I said, I am really disappointed in you. And he was like, well, do you still love me? And I was like, yes, I still love you. And he goes, does God still love me? And I was like, yes, God still loves you. And he's like, it is so good that God loves me, like, no matter what. Which I'd never, like, I don't, I'd never said that to him. Like, it's not like a discipleship thing that we do every day where we have a catechism where I'm like, God loves you no matter what. But like, when just will pick up little snatches of things and I'll just say things like, well, it's okay because God loves us no matter what. Or like, it's okay because God's going to take care of it. And I've just noticed how he's a sponge. He's like four years old. He is a sponge. And so even just the way that I talk about God and I'm a mom who like narrates life a lot for my kids all day. Like even when they're newborns, I'm like, and now we're gonna get your bottle and now we're changing your diaper and now we're, and so the, exactly. So the way that we narrate life, I think really matters in the way that we like narrate and teach them about God, even if it's not in a formalized way, really makes an impact. And I think that just reminded me of one thing it's just hard to discount the gift you give your child when you take them to church every Sunday, that that becomes the pattern of their life, you know? And so that makes me think of another question about the Sabbath. I don't know, do you all have any ways that you do spiritual disciplines on the Sabbath in a different way? Like how do you set that day aside to say, this is a particular day I can really pursue the things of God. Is that, a, is that a pattern you have in your home or any thoughts on that? Not a pattern, no. Should be, I guess. Um, <laughs> this pandemic felt like an entire Sabbath. I was like, man, I've never rested so much in my entire life. <laughs> so maybe Jasmine has a more. You know, that's why I didn't pick up the microphone. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. What about you, Melissa? Teach us. Do you, do you have a Melissa. Sabbath? Where you, you know, you dedicate to particular spiritual Tell us disciplines what to and do. stuff, huh? <laughs> I, I I do um, because <laughs> sorry. Of course. <laughs> um, you know, don't be embarrassed okay. by your righteousness. Oh my god! <laughs> you are a holy woman. Do not hide it under a bushel. Come on Let here. it shine. <laughs> this little light of mine. I'm gonna. You started, Bob. <laughs> okay, one thing I try to do on Sundays that's a little bit different is I love to read anyway. So I'm often reading, to be quite honest, just other books. Like I love to read history. I love to read lots of other books. But I try on Sundays to just choose a book to read that will help me spiritually. And I really love the Puritans. Like I like to go back to old things. And they're kind of tough. So I might only be able to read three pages because it's dense material. But I use that as the day to kind of be my reach day. So like if you were gonna have a day where you do sprints while running to push yourselves or lift a heavier weight, 
I just try to let Sunday be that day where I say, okay, today I'm just going to read something a little tougher than maybe what I could read during the week. So that's just one simple thing. Is that something that someone modeled for you or was that something that the Lord led you to do? I think it just, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know where I got that from. I, I picked it up somewhere, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but I don't know where. That's a, I think I just started saying, how can I make the Sabbath a little different? Hmm. You know, what can, She's what just can, that in tune with the Holy Spirit. She's great. <laughs> She's like, I don't even Modern know. day Jesus right here. Was it a dream or that time the angel came to me? We're playing with, we're playing with Melissa. She knows we love her. I'm going to go off the stage now. <laughs> You're blushing under your blush. They just can't see it. It's so cute. Um, when, when, you're, when you're busy, all of us are busy in, in, in some way. We're not as busy as we used to be, but I do think that as things are opening up, I'm starting to see my calendar begin to return to its old uh, fashion, and I don't like it. Um, so what do you, like, how do you realize that you are simply too busy to engage in spiritual disciplines? How do you even discern that? When I stop doing them. Okay. <laughs> well, let me, well, actually, here's what I will say. I do think there are certain signs, um, you know, like when you're hungry, your stomach growls and you know you need food. Um, and so I think spiritually, one thing I start noticing is I get really annoyed and I get real angry and I'm snapping at everybody around me and yelling at my kids. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, maybe I haven't eaten. You know, and I, I can see signs of what I call spiritual hunger in my life. You know, your friend's really annoying all of a sudden. And you, it just, and you know, you start seeing it in your life. I start seeing the lack of fruit. I, I see myself as a dry, brittle branch. And I'm like, I used to feel really condemned by that. And I used to say, oh, I'm just not a good Christian. Now I say, I just need Jesus. And I'm never going to graduate from that. I'm never going to have a day when I don't need Jesus. And when I just kind of accepted that, it was like, oh, well, now I know the solution. It's not to try to be the perfect Christian. It's to know Jesus. And so it changed it. I think times of refreshment can illustrate it, too. Um, Philip and I were in the hotel room yesterday, and we had just been going back and forth and having really good banter, and, like, nobody had gotten offended by anybody's banter. And he was like, man... We are different when we're not at home with those crazy kids. And I was like, yeah, it's yeah. We haven't been really faithful in setting aside like time. Like we, like we spend time together like on the couch and like we're in the same bed at night. But like going out to, we used to go out on dates together pre-pandemonium. And like just, you know, I've been calling it pancetta, pancetta Pandora, panorama. panorama. Mm -hmm. Somebody, Panda. somebody was like, um, "Do you call it a placenta because you love birth?" <laughs> I was like, "I haven't yet, but I will." Um, but just that time of refreshment illustrated for us that we needed to like incorporate it more as a rhythm. And so sometimes, like, I'll go to a conference like this, or uh, it happens to me every time I visit your church. Every time John O preaches a sermon, I'm like, "Oh, that's right." I have not been in the word enough. Okay. Amen. Thank you, John. Um, so, yeah, I think times of, times of um, dryness and times of re refreshment can both illustrate um, that it needs to become more of a daily pattern. Yeah, I noticed, um, I begun to notice, I began to notice that, like, I knew I was too busy when, one, I just had more anxiety like I would look at my calendar and literally feel myself get anxious and tense. Um, but I also notice when I don't have anything to give my family, you know, where it's like all of my energy and my thinking and my strategizing is going towards this thing or this book or this whatever. And then I come home and I want to rest from them where it's like, oh man, I shouldn't be giving more of my time and my love to something that d will not give me a legacy. My family in particular, or my church even. I mean, we ain't been to church yet because they just opened up last week, but that's neither here nor there. Um, like it's just, yeah, anxiety and just not giving people that I love what they deserve. That's a great point. And I remember my husband and I, we would do these like six month planning schedules. And for years I left them crying because we'd look at our calendar and every weekend, was so packed.
for the whole six months, or we had committed to things two years before, and now you have to do it. And finally, I started to realize I just need to say no so that I can, you know, you have to say no so you can say yes to what matters in your life. And that's a hard, that's the first discipline is saying no to a really good thing, good opportunities sometimes to always choose the better portion. And I think that probably sums up spiritual disciplines. Like how do we, I think you have to not think about just how do I want to live, but what do I say no to so that I can have that life? And, and I think we would all say this, what I can promise when I, I do think sometimes this topic can seem intimidating or um, heady or something like this. It will fuel love for Jesus. And so these things may sound like things to do or a checkoff list, but we know it's a relationship with Christ and that this is how you have life abundantly. So I always feel like I'm not telling you to go mop the floor. I'm telling you to go eat a feast. And so that's what spiritual disciplines help us do. Um, so I'm going to end us there and transition us to your favorite things. The closer, things. The closer, closer, ladies and gentlemen. Closer. Is that okay? Yes. Um, favorite things for today. Are y'all ready for this one? Did you know? Did you even look at it? Do you know? Okay, sure, sure, I did. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's your favorite modern convenience that wasn't available 20 years ago? So that's 2002. Wow. That's crazy. Because when I think 20 years, I think I like 85 or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think 2000 anything. Why did you say My that? My God. That's awful. I don't say microwave. I don't know. I, I literally, I was like, oh, yeah, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Telephones. 2002. What was invent? I guess social media. Inter- no, internet was already here. Google, was Google here. wasn't, I don't but think. The was iPhone Google? wasn't like, wasn't here, right? No? Let's say 30 years. 30 years. Okay, <laughs> 30 that's years. better. Okay. That's 91. 91. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I just got this Apple Watch, <laughs> and I like it a lot. I keep, okay, so my, where's Philip? Um, bought me this Apple Watch, and so I, my phone will be, like, in my pocket, and I'm like, where's my phone? And then I'll play the alarm and be like, oh, there it is. Got it. So that's, I don't think I knew it could do that. I will show you. Okay. It's so good. Okay. Philip, sorry, Mike. You know something I, I think, so I've lived in, I've lived in LA, Chicago, and now I'm in Atlanta. And so I've, I've been in cities that I wasn't born in a lot. Therefore, I needed to know my way around. And every time I pull up my GPS, I'm so thankful because I remember when we used to have to go to MapQuest and print them things out. <laughs> And before that, when I would go on trips, my mama would go to the store and get a little map and look at the little red lines to find out where we're supposed to go. And I said, how did people make it in the world without a GPS doing turn-by-turn directions? And they even talk to you, Melissa. Make a left, Jackie. I know. That's a blessing. They do it on their phone. I don't want that. They do it on your phone. The people become slaves to their phone with that thing. I ain't messing with that thing. Notification. Everybody wants me. I would feel so needed. Get it, Jackie. You have a lot of friends to text you. <laughs> That's the conflict episode. <laughs> we stop there. Um, I'm going to say something that is kind of stupid, but it's my seat warmer in my car. I love a seat warmer in my car when it's cold. That's not stupid. And I get in, and but I need the GPS. So too. they didn't have that in the '80s. That wasn't a thing. I don't think so. I, I Maybe I've here. just been driving old old cars for a long time. I don't- <laughs> I don't so, know. Maybe. Now they got, like it's they have seat like with air in it. Yeah. I don't have that Oh, yet. I have a 2000, we drive a 2002 Toyota Sequoia and it does not have a seat warmer or, or the little cord that you can listen to your phone with in the car. So, so this there you go. That's mine. That's mine. So I'm going to close this, Jackie. Time to close. It's <laughs> <laughs> the most awkward got 19 seconds. in the world. 15 seconds, no pressure. <laughs> That's it for this special life. <laughs> Y'all not supposed to laugh now. That's it for this special live episode of Let's Talk. Let's Talk is a podcast from the Gospel Coalition Podcast Network. The Gospel Coalition supports the church in making disciples of all nations by providing resources that are trusted and timely, winsome and wise, and centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thanks, y'all. Amen. Thanks, y'all.